Welcome back to our engineering mechanics lecture. And today we will continue where we left off in the last lecture. Remember last lecture we talked about centroid locations. And today I want to talk to you about moments of inertia. Moments of inertia is the word that engineers use most often. But scientifically speaking, it would be correct to call these second area moments. And just to give you a reference to our last lecture and to exercise your mind a little bit, remember that last lecture we calculated x bar, for example, by the integration or the summation of x tilde i times ai divided by the summation of ai. And why am I telling you this today is because I want to remind you that this portion here, which is an area times the lever arm, we called this the first area moment. And this was the first area moment about the y-axis. And I will talk a little bit about this, about the y-axis in today's lecture, because we will, of course, take this to the next step now. And we will move from the first area moment to the second area moment. And let me give you a little preview of why it's called that way. So here it's called the first area moment because we have a lever arm times an area. So first area moment, moment because the lever arm or a distance. And in this equation up here, it is a linear lever arm. So if this gets longer, the moment linearly increases. And so maybe you can already understand where the second area moment will take us. The second area moment will actually introduce a square here. So we will take the lever arm and multiply it by itself. And then we actually end up with the second area moment. However, I will refer to this as the moment of inertia or most often I will just in writing say MOI for moment of inertia. But before we talk about the moment of inertia, let's take a look at our objectives today. And let me tell you that the first thing we need to discuss is the material arrangement or the distribution of the geometry within the cross section. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you have a cross section that looks like this, right, you have all seen these I-beams before, there's a reason why engineers actually create these cross sections in such way or sometimes you have seen for example an angle or sometimes maybe even a tube and so on and those cross section distribution they have a reason and that's the first thing I want to talk to you about when we discussed the importance of the material arrangement. And once we have an understanding of that, I would like to talk to you about simple shapes first. So first we need to understand the meaning of simple shapes and the moment of inertia. So what are simple shapes in the context of this lecture? We are talking about shapes that are very well defined in terms of their geometric properties. So let's say a rectangle or a triangle, for example. Those shapes have very known easy geometric properties and so I can derive the moment of inertia for those shapes for you. Whereas for these shapes, which are actually composite shapes, so I have for example here a rectangle, a rectangle and a rectangle glued together, that is a little bit more complicated and that requires actually the parallel axis theorem. So the parallel axis theorem is the next thing I would like to talk to you about. And I need to define that because we want to ultimately talk about composite shapes. So if I want to calculate the moment of inertia for composite shapes, I first have to introduce to you moment of inertia for a simple shape and then the parallel axis theorem so we can combine such simple shapes into more complicated shapes like these that will then allow us to ultimately calculate the moment of inertia for composite shapes if we have all our puzzle pieces in place. So our last goal here today is to calculate the moment of inertia for composite shapes. So let's get started and let's take a look at it. And here's a beautiful picture 
that says so much about engineering and engineering design. And of course, our goal here is not to understand engineering design, but maybe conceptually I can explain this to you. So, for example, here you see a beam that spans from here to another girder. So here you see the girder, right? And here you see another girder and the girder holds a beam and another beam and another beam. And so the beam is a single span and then the girder holds multiple beams. And you can already see that there are different types of cross section chosen by the engineer here. For example, this is a very massive beam and this is a little bit less massive. However, then this column here is much wider, for example, than this horizontal beam. And the question is, why do engineers choose that? Why do we have a very tall beam here, whereas this one is very stocky, if you will? And there's a reason why engineers choose these different types of cross sections. So let me, for example, say that this girder here, for example, would be beam number one, whereas this here would be beam number two, and then this down here would be beam or column number three. And if I look at that, my number one beam actually is very tall and has a very narrow flange. These things are called flange on the bottom and on the top, whereas the thing in the middle is called the web. And then if I look at shape number two, two I actually have a beam that is as narrow, but not as high. And there's a reason for that as well. And then if I look at shape number three, that shape number three actually is very wide compared to the other ones. So the flange is actually much wider than it is for the other beams relative to the height of the cross section. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is what's called the load path or the intensity of load that goes through the system. So you can probably imagine that these beams, they are actually simply supported beams. They are hung into this girder here. So here you can see the connection and you can idealize this as a simply supported beam in there. So let me actually draw that for you if I get my ruler out here. So for example, this very first beam here on the top, this one could be a simply supported beam. And that simply supported beam is carrying some load of everything that sits on top of it. And in this case, it probably would be an evenly distributed force on here. And based on this evenly distributed force and the dimensions of the beam, you could clearly calculate it, calculate R a y and r b y we have done this in this class before and once you have that you can actually apply that i'm going to use a different color for this but it's the same force so i can apply that here to the next girder and then i have that here too actually i have it on both sides because it, it carries one of these on each side right so i have one here in the front and one in the back and I have that multiple times, so maybe I'll draw that one more time here. So there's RAY, there's no beam on the other side for that one, but you get the idea. So now I can draw the entire beam here, and this entire beam now has to carry all that load, and then there would be a support reaction there as well, and there might be even one here on the top that we don't see, it's outside of the picture, but I just add that for you. So let's say there's another support right there. And you understand that these beams now actually start to smile or bend, right? We call it smiling here in this class, but there are forces pushing down, forces pushing down, forces pushing down, and this beam wants to smile. And this beam is very long and has to carry a lot of load. And therefore, engineers purposely make this a larger cross section because the real trick here, and I will explain this to you many times throughout the lecture, is that each of these cross section has a centroid location that we calculated before. So I'm going to call that C, C, C. And the centroid location is very far away from the outer material part, right? So you can see that for this shape number one, the outer material part is much further removed from the centroid than it is for shape number two. Or if I go in here, shape number one is very tall and the centroid is very far away from the outer material component, whereas here for shape number two, it is much closer together. And so you know that this beam actually is weaker 
against bending than this one is. In fact, we all know this from experience. If you take your ruler and you try to bend it, you can bend it in two directions, either about the strong axis or the weak axis. And your ruler usually has a very weak, weak axis and you can actually bend it. But if you then flip it by 90 degrees, you cannot bend it. And the same is true for these types of girders here or beams. So if you were to apply a force in this direction, then it would be very difficult for the beam to bend. But if you apply a force in that direction, then it becomes easier to bend. And now you probably also understand why the engineer then here choose for number three, a much wider beam. And that is because of buckling. So let's say there's a support reaction here, right? So we have another support reaction here, which I'm gonna call also RAY. And that support reaction from the beam, of course, has to be somehow carried to the ground. So I'm gonna try to show that to you. So I have this column here. And of course, RAY ultimately has to push down here. So this now is RAY, whereas this is identical to this. And it has to carry all the way down to the foundation. And so that force now pushes down. And that force wants to actually cause this column to buckle. What is buckling? Buckling means it goes out to the side or comes to the front here. This has multiple dimensions. So let me actually give you a coordinate system here. So let's say you have a coordinate system that is X, Y, and then of course here you have the Z direction. And so if you have compression in the Z direction, your column may move out to the Y or to the X direction. And because the force that causes this buckling is only RAY here on the top, that's why the engineer had to design a much wider column relative to these here, because this material, this material element here is much further removed from the centroid than this one is in the horizontal direction. So let me repeat that to you. So let's say I have a coordinate system here. I have a x and the y direction in this case right and so now i have actually a distance of this material element like right down here at the right corner to the centroid and the distance here in the x direction it is much less than it is for this material element here so th this also has the x y coordinate system and therefore this one here can actually withstand loads in both directions much better. So let's say I have a force that pushes in this direction and a force that pushes in this direction. So this section number three is much stronger about both axes. So let me just make sure that we understand this because I'm gonna use these terms throughout the lecture. It's called bending about strong axis and weak axis. And so here you have a x-axis, so I call that x, and then here we have a y-axis, so there's a y-axis, and bending about the y-axis would be caused by fx, right? So here you see fx, and so bending about y-axis, caused by fx in that case. And of course, bending about the x-axis would be caused by fy. And so now you can guess which one is the strong and which one is the weak axis. So bending about the strong axis would be bending about the x-axis. So I'm gonna write that down for you in, as well. So bending about the strong axis is equal to bending about the x-axis. That is true for this shape here. It's actually true for this one as well. Here it's technically true as well. However, this has a much stronger weak axis than these two have. 
And that is the reason why engineers choose these type of designs and they actually arrange the material in very specific ways. And we will now try to understand how to calculate that so that in the future you will be able to actually design such shapes and to arrange the material correctly. Let me talk about that for a second. So this here is material arrangement, but it's actually the geometric property, right? So the moment of inertia is actually a numerical way to classify or quantify the resistance to bending, right? So moment of inertia is how we quantify the resistance to bending. And let me spend one more second talking about that. So let's take this purple beam here. It wants to bend down, right? It, like this beam here would go down in this direction and that would be bending about the x-axis here in, in this cross-sectional picture. So we would have downwards bending, which then would cause bending about the strong axis. And that is quantified by the moment of inertia which then hopefully is a large number because we want a lot of resistance to bending about the x-axis. Okay, now that we understand that from a big picture point of view, we can now look a little bit into a conceptualized image here. And let me explain to you what's going on. So we have the carrying load members here, the beams that you see, they are arranged. So here's the girder. Remember a girder carries other beams here. It's called a filler beam. And then on top of that, you have, for example, a steel deck, which then provides kind of the formwork for the concrete on top of it. And the question is, how does the engineer really calculate the force acting on these beams? Because the force acting on the beams really decides what kind of cross section the engineer should pick here. So let me conceptually talk about that. And let me tell you that, for example, this beam that I will now highlight for you in red or mark with for you in red. So let's take this as an example. This beam has a specific cross section. And why did the designer decide it this way? Because there is actually a field here, right? So I'm gonna go halfway between those two beams and I'm gonna do the same thing in the adjacent field. So, and maybe for reference, I also give me the center line here and the center line here. And I will tell you that this distance is, for example, W. And then this distance here is W over 2. And that's also true here, W over 2, because the engineer probably would choose this to be W as well. Why am I telling you this? Because now you can go ahead and actually find everything that sits on top of this field, right? So you can use the density of concrete and the volume of the material that sits on top of it. And then you can use that information to calculate how much weight, how much force is actually sitting on this beam. So I say that again. So let's say you know the height of the concrete, then you can calculate how heavy the concrete is based on the concrete's density. That is beyond the purpose of this class. This is an analytical class, but this is the concept that you would use. And then once you have that, you would actually turn this into a force. I'm gonna use a different color here now, but technically this would be green as well. So you have an evenly distributed force now acting on this beam. And this evenly distributed force now, once again, produces a support reaction. So that would be somewhere here. I'm gonna call that R-A-Y. And then that ultimately has to sit on the girder. So the girder here, I'm gonna highlight that for you as well. I'm gonna use a different color for this. So we have the girder here and that girder now is loaded with a force here, which that would be R-A-Y as well. And then here we would have the next R-A-Y, let's call it I and I, and so on and so forth. And then you can calculate how much force the beam is carrying. And then based on that, after today's lecture, you will understand how strong or like how 
the material should be arranged to create these cross sections here. So these cross sections have a specific purpose and they act against bending as I explained to you above. So let's now talk about the second area moment for different shapes. Here we see first what's called an eye beam or often it's called an I beam but actually this is an S shape or sometimes when they are wider they call W shape W for wide but this here would actually be an S shape however engineers would always refer to this as an I beam and the I beam is very good about bending about the strong axis but not so good about the weak axis right we I think we discussed that in the previous picture then I also have a channel here on the bottom left next to it. So that's called a C channel. So C channel. And then I have a pipe. And I have an angle. And I have a square tube or rectangular tube. Sometimes also pipe doesn't matter and now if you paid attention then you might already be able to tell that some of these are very good for single directional bending whereas some of them for example the pipe and the tube are very good about both directions or biaxial bending so again if i apply a force to this beam in this direction the i beam that might be very good. However, if I apply a force in this direction, it's not as strong. Whereas for the pipe, for example, if I apply a force here and a force here, it is actually pretty much suited for that. And similar for the tube that has very good, strong and weak axis. In fact, the tube has no weak and strong axis. Both axes are identical. However, the angle and the channel, for example, they are very good about one axis, but not so good about another axis. So now let's look at real life pictures here on the top. We have four pictures of very common shapes. What you see here, for example, is called the Florida I-beam. This I-beam is like one Raphael tall. It's like taller than six feet from here to here. It's a very massive beam, Florida I-beam. Before we used Florida I-beams, we used what's called an ash toe beam here on the bottom. Then we have a hollow concrete slab and we have a double T girder or beam, depending on how you want to call it. But let's go through them one by one. So why do engineers build these? And the question that I most often get in the classroom is, hey, uh, why do we not just create a rectangle? And the reason is due to what we already started talking about. So here is the centroid location, right? And remember that if there's a centroid location, there's also a centroid axis. So I'm going to try to draw that into here. And so the bending over that axis is important. And what's very important is that you have a lot of material down here that is actually removed from... So I, I'm going to simplify this a lot right now. But this material down here is very far away from the centroid location. And the further away you move this, the stronger the beam will be against bending. And that's why you can also see very long Florida I-beams because they have a lot of material on the bottom, a lot of material on the top that is very far removed from the centroid. I mean, in all fairness, I need to tell you that there's also a lot of pre-stressing steel down here that is way beyond the purpose of this class. You should take classes like concrete design to learn more about that. Um, but that is another reason why the, this beam is so wide here on the bottom so that they can put a lot of pre-stressing steel in here. However, it is a good reason to move a lot of material down away from the centroid and it helps the engineer to really provide a lot of resistance. And by the way, in on the contrary or in reverse, so all this material here that has been removed from the cross section that would be very close to the centroid location and therefore it wouldn't offer a lot of resistance uh, resistance to bending and so that's why engineers built these beams like this similar down here this is the like i said the ash toe girder 
And the ash girder has the same idea, right? So there's a lot of material here, bulky on the top, on the bottom, but nothing in the middle. And this one would be maybe even easier to be converted into a rectangle, but then we would have a lot of material here and that would not be conducive towards carrying the loads. So let me just to bring that home also at the centroid location here so that you understand that the material is far away from the centroid location for the concrete slab here the hollow slab is the same so there was a centroid location right there and what's the trick here same thing the material here in the middle is not really helping remember that if the beam smiles you have compression on the top tension on the bottom and so the material in the middle does not really resist that tension or compression and so you don't really need it and this is true for all these pictures here in fact, it's also true for my double T beam here. You see these double T beams a lot in parking garage structures and so on. They are very comfortable um, structure components because they are very easy to fabricate, very easy to transport. And as you can see, they have two legs, so they never tip over. They are easy to store and they're easy to install. In fact, engineers use these like they use Lego blocks. And this is also true for all of these precasted elements. So these are precast concrete elements that engineers use as Lego blocks, but they are very much engineered to resist bending about the strong axis. And these do that very well. And engineers have used those and perfectionized those structures in many scenarios. Let me talk about the last thing here again in reference to the rectangular section why is the rectangular section not a thing so we remove material and one thing that i talked about the whole time here is that we do this to remove the material from the centroid location that is number one but we also remove material and removing material saves cost and saves weight All right so you can imagine that these concrete beams are very heavy and they have to carry their own load if you will when they span from here to here and so removing that material is really beneficial and saves cost and so it's a win-win-win situation really for engineers and this is why we use such structures and why we engineer structures in such a way okay so now that we have a general understanding of the moment of inertia and where we want to go with this right so ultimately we want to be able to calculate the moment of inertia for such difficult structures but before we do that Let's focus actually on simple shapes and simple shapes ultimately will be rectangles, triangles and such things. But for now, I would like to focus on this potato chip here. It's actually not a potato. It's important to understand that we're talking about an area. And so the area is really a potato chip. And you see that this area has ultimately many of these DAs, so tiny area elements, and each area element has a centroid location in the middle of this area element, and that has a distance to the origin of the coordinate system. So you see the distance here is given with Y and with X, and if I now want to talk about the moment of inertia, let's now start deriving the formulas. So I'm going to call that IX, and that means the moment of inertia is the i m o i and the x means about the x-axis and that is very important to me in fact i will highlight that for you right now this about here is very important i need you to understand that we're talking about the moment of inertia about the x-axis and it's defined as follows if you really use integration math here then you use the area integration of y squared dA. And let's talk about that for a second. So what the, where does this y come from? It's kind of confusing, right? Because we're talking about ix, and then we have a y here in the formula. But if you think about it, it's the moment of inertia about the x-axis. So that means about this axis. And if you think of this area element, dA, rotating about this x-axis, then the lever arm is the y-direction. So I want you to imagine this potato ship or the area element 
to rotate about this axis. So right now it's coming towards you, towards you, towards you, towards you, towards you, and now it's moving away, 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 and then it moves away, 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 and, and then it comes towards you, towards you, towards you, and it comes towards you, towards you, towards you, and so on. So that is how the potato ship rotates about the x-axis, and for that to happen, you need to have the distance y. And it's very confusing for beginners to have the moment of inertia about the x-axis and then see a y in this equation. But you can probably now, with the help of this picture, understand where that is coming from. Another very important thing is that we have the squared component here. So the squared component is very important because students all the time forget this. And I have made bets with my students in the past, jokingly, that if nobody forgets to square this, then everybody gets an A on the final exam. And, you know, it has, I never had to do it. I, like, I probably have taught thousands of students and made the bet with thousands of students that if nobody in the class forgets to square this component, then everybody gets an A, but apparently the students didn't like that. They didn't want that A because at least five out of 50 students keep forgetting to square that. But it's a very important part. And you may ask yourself, why is this? Why do I have to square this? And it has something to do with the rotation about the x-axis. And it's physically very complicated to explain. However, I think you all have experienced this in one way or the other. So let me take you down memory lane when you were playing in the backyard with a bucket of water and you put the bucket of water on your hand and you rotated it above your head and you were surprised that the water didn't fall out. And this falling out of water has nothing to do with the moment of inertia, but the force that you felt when you rotated the bucket in your arm, you actually had something to do with this component here. So think about that. If you extended your arm longer and longer, if you made this very long, in fact, if you maybe even add a string to that bucket and you keep rotating it, you will very quickly realize that you cannot hold on to the bucket anymore. And why is that? Because you're actually experiencing the square component here. So the square component um, becomes much more intense if Y gets larger. And again, you can experience this when you rotate the bucket because the further away the bucket gets from your shoulder, if you will, take the shoulder as your rotation point, then this will actually increase and increase. And remember that before, when we talked about the moment of inertia, sorry, when we talked about the centroid location, right? I'll write that formula again. Centroid location was the sum of x tilde i, or well, actually let's talk about y tilde ai, which then would make this here also y so let's fix that and then some ai and remember that this part here in the brackets was the first area moment about the x-axis right so this is about x-axis for the very same reason as i explained here on this page but now notice that i actually have a second area moment and this is where the square comes in and so this here is a second area moment, and this is the definition for that. So, and what is it? It's the lever arm squared times the area, which also tells us something very important about this formula. And that is that the units, and I'll let you guess for a second what the unit will be. So the unit, of course, will be length times length times length times length. So we have a very strange unit here, which is actually length to the power of four. And so this must always be true. It must always be length to the power of four because you have a lever arm that is squared times an area. And that's how we quantify the moment of inertia. So the moment of inertia usually ends up with meter to the power of four or inch to the power of four or feet to the power of four, whichever one you want. So that has always be true. It's very difficult for a beginner to get used to these um, dimensions, but maybe you can memorize for now that it needs to be to the power of four because you have a lever arm that is squared and an area that is squared. All right, so it might not come as a surprise to you that I can do the same thing about the y-axis. So moment of inertia about the y-axis 
And it also doesn't come as a surprise to you that I take the area integral and now I square x actually and dA. And then this is also in length to the power of four. So same thing, just that now you're actually rotating about the y-axis. So that's actually important. So let's write that down. So this is the moment of inertia about y-axis. And I say it one more time for the risk of boring you that this is about, right? It's not in the direction of the y-axis. Students often come to me and tell me like, hey, this is the moment of inertia in the, in the y-direction. But no, it's not. It's about the y-axis. It's not in the direction of something. And now to keep no secrets from you and to tell you the full story, let me also tell you that you could also rotate about the pole. We will not do much about this, but for completeness, I'm going to add this formula here. But you can take the moment of inertia about the pole. So this would be about the z-axis. But because you're dealing with an area or the potato ship and not the entire potato, this is not a three-dimensional body. Because it's not a three-dimensional body, this would not be iz. Although a lot of people call it iz, right? iz. But it's actually better called j O, which is the polar moment of inertia. And now the question is, how do you calculate that? But the answer is already given in this picture, right? You have R here, you have Y here, and you have X here. And remember that from your basic trigonometry classes or geometry classes that R square is equal to X square plus Y square in this example. And therefore, you can actually say that your integral now needs to be x squared plus y squared and then dA. But because of this relationship here, because of that, you might as well calculate r directly. And you can do that by the integral. Actually, it's not an integration anymore by just summing up ix and iy. So nothing could be simpler. And that's why it, I think it's a waste of time for me to make you calculate the polar moment of inertia, because really all you have to be able is to calculate the moment of inertia about x and about y. But when you hear polar moment of inertia, this is the formula that you would use. And ultimately, in practice, you would end up using this. So now we have this f defined for a general case here on this page. And that's great. What I want to do with you next is to actually classify and characterize this formula here, these ix and iy, for very common shapes. I want to do it for rectangulars, triangulars, for squares, circles, semicircle, and so on and so forth, so that you don't have to deal with these integration. Remember that ultimately for the centroid location we also started with an integration formula first but ultimately ended up with the summation here of a finite formula so i want to do the same thing for you now and want to move from infinite integration to finite integration and that's what we're going to do on the next page all right so now we have a table here that shows us many different shapes and let me zoom in on these shapes because I want to explain something to you before I get started fulfilling the content here. So you see that these shapes have two axes. They have a reference axis which is the uppercase letters here or the blue axis and then they have the red axis that pass through the centroid location. You already know how to find the centroid location but now I want to show you what the formulas are for the moment of inertia. However, we will, of course, bring in the centroid location here. So we will first calculate the area for each of these. Then we will define the centroid location in the x direction relative to this corner, to the origin of the coordinate system. Then we will do it for the y direction, again, to this corner. And then we will calculate ix and iy. And what I will do here is I will take the formula from the previous page and apply it to this shape, this shape, this shape, and then give you the ultimate answer. 
And again, you have to understand that there are two axes here shown in each of these pictures, one axis that is the reference axis and one axis that is the centroid location axis. And with that said, let's get started. Before I get started, let me remind you that I x was equal to the integral of the area of y square dA. So that would be our first column there. And I'm just doing this as a reference for myself. And my iy was equal to the area element x square dA. Okay, so now let's start to populate this table. For a rect for a square, it's very straightforward. You know the area here would be b squared, no surprise there. You know that the centroid location would be b over 2. And same is true for the y direction, b over 2, because it's a, it is a rectangle or actually a square. Therefore, it's identical x bar and y bar. And the same is true for ix and iy. And now if I want to focus or complete these equations, like we could derive them and I could prove to you what the numbers will be here, but I will just now go ahead and tell you what to plug in here. So this here would be b to the power of 4 divided by 12. And for now, you just have to believe me. Again, you can derive this. You may ask yourself, where is this 12 coming from? The, the power of 4 may be very obvious to you because we see here squared and area. So there must be a power of 4 here. Um, but I think this should be enough for now. And because it's a square, of course, we have the same in the other direction. Now let's make it a little bit more interesting and move on to the rectangle. Of course, you know that the area is B times H. No surprise there. You also know that the X centroid location is B over 2, whereas the Y centroid location is H over 2. And now maybe you can already guess where we have to go with this formula here. So remember, there's coming from so Y squared DA is really the base times the height, right? So and here base and height was the same. So B and B, but now I have B and H. And so maybe I need to take one of them out here. So the, the height or the base. And in fact, I have to take the base out. So it's base times height to the power of three divided by 12. And now by necessity, you see that if B and H is the same, then these formulas would be the same, right? Which has to be the case. And again, if you think along, you already know that now I have to flip my logic here and now it becomes h times b to the power of 3 divided by 12. And I will talk more about this at the end, but this is a formula you definitely need to remember. This is like if you're an engineer, this is something you want to remember for the rest of your life. You will see this in many different occasions throughout your engineering career. And it's definitely something you will need over and over again. So b h cubed over 12 for a rectangle. Now, how does this apply to a triangle? Let's do the obvious first. The area is one half B times H. The centroid location, we already talked about this in previous classes, is one third B. And be careful here in this case, because we're going from here to here. So it's one third and not two thirds. However, if my reference axis would be here, then it would be two thirds. But the way this is given here, it's one third. Now, same is true for H, one third third h and now the question comes hmm, how do i apply this and let me point your attention to the triangle which is really kind of a rectangle that is cut in half right and so now if you would just blindly think about that you may want to guess that it would be bh cubed over 24 but that's not the case because remember that the height also is squared in here and so on and so you have to be careful with that but let me just tell you what you would plug in here. It would be b times h to the cube. That remains the same. And then you have to divide it by 36. And that 36 comes from the triangle being cut in half or the rectangle being cut in half to a triangle, I should say. But now the next one should not be tricky for you. It is just h times b to the power of 3 divided by 12 
and that is another formula you need to remember or memorize. Okay, let's talk about the circles. It becomes a little bit more interesting now. Of course, you know the area for a circle, pi r square. And you also know how to calculate the distance from the centroid, from the centroid axis to the coordinate origin, which is r in this case. So no surprise there, r, the radius, same is true for the other direction. And now I will tell you that often I have to look this up, but this is why I'm giving you the for this table here, right? So I want you to always be able to look all of these up at once. If these ones I will always remember, but uh, for circles, maybe I should remember them as well. But engineers, you know, they, they live in tables and they have to look up many tabulated values. So what I'm trying to tell you is like, don't feel bad if you cannot remember all of them. Um, I just give you all of them here at once. And if I need anything more complicated than the shapes here, I probably would consult a tabulated book or probably use the internet to find my correct numbers. However, here I will now give you the formula and the formula here would be pi times r to the four divided by four. And it's very important that here the to the power of four is there because once again, square times squared is to the power of four and pi is not, uh, does not have a dimension, it's just a factor. And so therefore my r needs to be to the power of four. You probably understand that for the i, y, same thing, right? Because it is symmetric about every axis the circle has. So I can just rewrite this. Now for the semicircle, it's a little bit different, but maybe we can get there as well. So first of all, the area half pi r square and in the x direction, the distance from the axis to the, from the coordinate origin to the centroid axis would be also r. And now something that you probably want to memorize for your exam, which is 4r over 3 pi. And again, on your exam, you may, you may look it up, but I usually expect my students everything in this formula to memorize, at least for the test, right? After that, you can forget it, but you need to know where to find it. So how does this apply to the moment of inertia? Moment of inertia would now be actually, surprise, surprise, half of what we had before. So that means I have to divide this by eight. So pi r to the four divided by eight. And just because it's so much fun, let's actually also add a semicircle to it. So let me draw the axis here. Sorry, not a semicircle, a quarter circle. So I'm gonna add one more row to your table, which includes now a quarter circle and that quarter circle has a centroid location as well and this has therefore also axes and now I can define my formulas for that last component. So what is my area? My area of course is one quarter pi r squared. My x location now is very similar to what I have above, 4r divided by 3 pi. And that is the case for both of them now, because it's symmetric about those two axes. And guess what? It is now this, the, quarter the quarter circle is the semicircle divided in two. So therefore now we have pi r to the power of four divided by 16. And this again, pi r four divided by 16. So now you have a table here that is a good reference for you to always find the centroid location and the moment of inertia. And of course the area, but you knew that already. Let me talk about the moment of inertia here because remember, this is the moment of inertia for simple shapes. So that is fairly important and therefore I want to make an extra note here on the bottom. So this here is moment of inertia for individual shapes.
And that is important to understand. But more important to understand is that this is the moment of inertia about, about the centroid axis of the individual shape. So that is very important to understand, and I don't know if that already clicked or not, but I want to highlight this for you because it is such an important thing to understand once we move on with this. So what I have given to you here is the moment of inertia for these individual shapes that you see here. But it's not just the moment of inertia about any axis, it's only the moment of inertia about this x-axis and this y-axis, for example. So the red axis here, and that is what you need to understand here. Maybe it makes no sense for you right now why I'm trying to put your attention to this, because you have not seen how we progress with this. But I need you in the future to understand that these are the moment of inertia about the centroid axis of the shape. And in fact, how we gonna term this in the future is actually i bar x prime and i bar y prime so in future equations we will refer to these terms that we have derived in this equi in these tables here or in this table we will actually refer to them as i bar x prime and i bar y prime so that's what we really have defined here and that is important for us to understand because our next step is what we want to now look into shapes that are combined shapes so let's pretend for example our next shape will be an i-beam and i'm just trying to draw a simple one for you here that is made of effectively three rectangles and each of these rectangles has an individual centroid location, but also the entire shape as a centroid location. So I'm going to put this here as C total. But keep in mind that I can section this into element 1, which has a centroid location. So I'm going to call this here C1. And then I'm going to have another one down here, which has a centroid location there. So that is C2. And then I have one that is actually coinciding with this here. So this is C3. And why am I showing this to you right now? Because if I were now to just sum up my i-axis and my i-y's, I would completely underestimate the moment of inertia. So if I just say, hey, I'm going to use this formula because they're all rectangles and I'm just going to take the formula for this rectangle, for this rectangle, and for this rectangle, and I sum them up, then I'm completely missing out the fact that this area is far removed from the total centroid. And therefore, I have forgotten that there is stiffness due to gluing these pieces together, if you will. Right? And you can try this at home. You can just take like two somewhat elements, let's say like a wooden bar or something like that, and then hold them together or like bend, uh, bend them individually, but then nail them together or glue them together and then bend them again. And you will see it's much more difficult than just the sum of the individual ones. And so that's our next step. So now that we have on this table defined everything that we need to know for individual moment of inertia. So the moment of inertia for this, for this and for this, we now need to use this information and combine them properly so that we can benefit from the stiffness that the entire system provides. And this is one component in that formula and I will do that with you on the next page. So now we're ready to take it to the next step and actually look at combined shapes or composite shapes. And to do that, please take a look at this mechanics potato chip here again. And notice that now we have a centroid location and centroid axes. And so the axes here are given with X prime and Y prime. And they are completely removed from our randomly chosen coordinate origin 
which also has an x-axis and a y-axis and notice that the x-axis is parallel to the x-prime axis and the y-axis is parallel to the y-prime axis and that's why we actually are talking here about the parallel axis theorem. Parallel axis theorem. So we want to discuss what effect now does it have if I remove the potato chip from a coordinate origin. So imagine that initially the x prime axis and the y prime axis lay on top of the x and the y axis here, but then we removed it along this line here, which is given with d. And so what you end up with is these distances that are twofold, like for the area element dA here, it has a distance to the centroid of the potato chip, which is given with y prime or x prime. And then also it has a distance to the randomly chosen coordinate system, which is given with dy here. So let me explain that again. This coordinate system here is usually chosen by the engineer, depending on what's most convenient. But this coordinate system is defined by the potato chip. And because the potato chip defines this, every area element within the potato chip has two distances to this origin here, which one of them is y prime and one of them is dy. And so if I now apply my formula from before, then remember that my x, ix actually is equal to the area integral of that distance, right? But what is that distance now? It's actually y prime plus dy and then square the whole thing and dA. So now that I have that dA, let me look at that again or let me explain that to you. Where is this coming from? The y prime is this value right here. Whereas the dy is the value here. In fact, it's so important for us that I'm going to highlight them with colors. So the dy is this component, whereas the y prime is actually this component here. And notice again that we are, of course, squaring the distance. That's a requirement for the ix. And now if I expand this formula, that's my next step now, just for you to see how we end up with all this. So now my ix is actually the expansion of this entire formula. And that turns out to be the integral of the area of y prime squared dA. And then I have 2 dA times the integration, the area integration of y prime dA and I have the dA, sorry, dy squared times the integration of dA and that's an area element. And now we have effectively three components. Let me highlight those three components for you. So I have the first component here, I have the second component here and I have my third component right here. Let's talk about these individually. So the first component is really nothing else than what you've seen before, just that we're using a prime in the Y now. So this is really the moment of inertia of the individual shape. So this is the moment of inertia of individual shape. And remember that this is also the about the centroid axis about the centroid axis of individual shape so this is what we actually have seen on the previous table so this is from previous table All right, now the second part actually turns out to be zero because the x prime axis passes through the area centroid, right? So this is equal to zero. There's nothing to it. And that is because the x prime axis, 
that is this one here passes through the centroid of the potato chip so because the xy axis passes through centroid of individual shape. So I don't have to worry about that one. Last thing I have to worry about is what is this third component here in red and what do we see? We see dy and what is dy is the distance from the origin of the coordinate system to the centroid and what is da da is just the area element itself so that i want to formulate as well so this is d includes dy and of course dy here is squared right so is the distance between the centroid of the individual shape and the coordinate origin. And that is very important to understand, but please also keep in mind that this is squared, right? All right, so that's dy. And what is summation dA? The summation dA is also a component of this. So A dA is just total area of individual shape. And now we kind of have deciphered the entire thing. So let me rewrite it one more time for you with only the important components ix is equal to the area integral of y prime squared da plus dy squared integration of the area da and that is technically an important formula however i'm going to make it easier for you because i will now move from infinite sum to finite sum and then i believe it will make more sense for us so the way we will write this formula in the future is actually such that i x is the summation from i to n of i x bar prime plus a i d y squared and so all of that summed up because it depends on how many area elements i have let me decipher this for you and tell you where what is coming from so the i bar x prime is really this component here the d y squared component is right here and then the area element is right there so just for completeness reasons we're gonna highlight this so you know where it's coming from and that is this and this is also from table that i've shown you on the previous page then we have the area here so here we have the area individual area And then last but not least, we have this component here, which is squared, which you find again here, which is the, I call it centroidal distance. Centroidal distances. But keep in mind, like this is just my short version of saying this, I will use this from here on centroidal distances. What I really mean is the distance between the centroid of the individual shape and the coordinate origin. And that, of course, needs to be squared, as you see here. So this is the formula you ultimately want to remember from this lecture. So let me make sure that I highlight that for you.
So this is a very important formula. In fact, that's why I gave you the entire lecture today. And I will also, of course, for completeness reasons, give you I y, which is equal to the sum of I to n for I bar y prime plus a i and then d x squared. Kind of the same formula as before. So you really only have to remember one formula in total. But again, both of them are important. So let's highlight those and let's make sure that you memorize them. Okay, so now we have everything we need really to understand the moment of inertia, except we haven't applied it. That will come in the following problems. But for now, for your convenience, so we talked about the parallel axis theorem, which comes from the fact that an area is often removed from the centroid location of an entire shape or from the origin of a coordinate system. And so we use the parallel axis theorem, which used these two distances, the y prime and dy, which you see here. And then we expanded the equation and we noticed that this must be zero and that we're really only left with these two components where this one comes from the previous page from the table. And we just need to understand that we have to ha calculate an individual area and the centroidal distances. And you may already understand this, but how to apply this is, of course, due to a lack of practice, a little bit complicated, but that's where we will now focus on. I, I want to next show you how do we actually use these formulas so that you can use them professionally to actually calculate the moment of inertia for any shape that will ever cross your way. But this is the part of the lecture that is all theory. We're done with that now and I will see you for the example problems. Okay, so here we have a very introductory moment of inertia problem. Let's, of course, as always, read the problem statement first. Determine the moments of inertia, and the S there stands for Ix and Iy. Often when I give a problem like this on the exam, students just calculate Ix or Iy and they forget that they have to calculate the moment of inertia about both axes. And then, um, yeah, notice that it's an I-beam here in this case and it's a double symmetric I-beam. And that means that you already know where the centroid location is. So this is a very first problem. So I'm not going to make you calculate the, mo the centroid location because you already know that it's here due to symmetry in fact let's write that down so due to symmetry centroid location is known and in fact it's already given in this picture right so you know it's already half the height and half the width Another thing that is nice for us here due to symmetry is that the top half is kind of equivalent to the bottom half or the right is equivalent to the left. But that is something that should not be of interest to you right now. That is something that will help you later on. But right now, because it's an educational problem, I just want to focus on how to calculate my formulas or how to fulfill my formulas. So the first thing I usually do when I write these problems is remind myself that I have to take the sum of i x bar prime plus a i d y squared so that is my first formula my second formula is i y is equal to i bar y prime plus a i d x squared and so last thing left to do is to understand how we can use this and remember that here we're talking about AIs, so individual areas. So my first job is to discretize the cross section, which of course here is already done for you. So there's not a lot of mystery left here. So let's pretend that I have a shape A1 here, so A1. And then maybe I have a shape down here, which of course is the same, but for educational reasons is A2. And then last but not least, I have this one here which is a three. 
and now I will try to show you how I fulfill this component and these components for each individual shape. And I tell you upfront that a lot of professors or a lot of books even recommend that you should use like a tabulated method. Once again, I think for a shape like this, a tabulated method is a waste of time. There's nothing wrong with a tabulated method. But to really understand which component goes where, I'm going to stay away from this here in this lecture. Um, for your homework, you can, of course, use that if you want to. But for understanding purposes, it's better to look at it from an analytical standpoint and not from a plug and chuck standpoint. So how do I fulfill my formula now? Ix, I'm going to focus on this formula first. Remember that this component here has something to do with base height cube divided by 12 for a rectangle and so on. So I need to apply that to my area number one. So let's do that. And what is my base for that area? My base is 200 and my height is 50 millimeters and that needs to be cubed and divided by 12. So that comes from the table and I now completed my first portion here. Now my next portion is the AI and the distance. The A of course is easy for everybody. So that would be 200 times 50. And now I need some lever arm. So what is the lever arm? Remember what dy is. dy is actually the distance between the centroids. So I have a centroid here, the total centroid, and I have a centroid here. I'm going to draw that in there for you. So there's my C1. And then I also have a C total, which is right there. C total. So now how do I calculate the distance? I would argue that the distance there would be 300 divided by 2 plus 50 divided by 2. Very important, not forgetting to square it, right? And so this completes my entire first area. And I say that again. So AI is easy, 200 times 50. The distance now is the distance from here to here in the x direction. And so that's 300 halves because that's this distance divided in two and then 50 halves, which is from here to here. So I can finish that now. Next up, I have to add my next area element. And you, if you have a sharp eye, you already say, hey, it's exactly the same as this one and you are true. But again, this is an educational problem. So I want to use this as an opportunity to explain something very specific to you about this area, which actually is in the negative y direction. So let's do it anyways, although once you are familiar with these problems, you don't need to do that anymore. But base is 200, 50 is the height, cubed divided by 12. And now my area is still 200 times 50. And what is my lever arm now? So there's a C2 here. And the distance, of course, is from here to here. And that would be a distance of 300 halves plus 50 halves. But technically speaking, this would be a negative distance, right? Why can we still ignore that? Because we square it here. So you see that this formula here allows us to use negative numbers here and ignore the fact that this is actually in a negative direction. So this is different from when you calculated centroid locations of shapes, then you have to really worry about positive and negative in your formulas. Here you don't have to worry about it because a negative um, value squared will always give you a positive value anyway. So this purple part here is exactly the same as this part, but again, I wanted to get that educational point across. So I'm gonna do that. Last but not least, I also have to include my blue area here. So let's zoom out a little bit and I have to add that as well. What is the base now? So the base in this case is 50, right? So the base times height, the height now is 300. So 300 cubed over 12. And now plus the area, which is 50 times 
300 multiplied by, I'll let you guess that for a second, what goes in here. I definitely have to square it. And what really goes in there is actually zero, right? Because the centroid of A3 coincides with the total centroid of the entire shape. So I actually gonna plug in zero here. And that means that this entire part here goes to zero. So I don't have to worry about that. And hopefully that makes sense to you. I, I repeat it one more time. So the centroid of the entire shape of C total coincides with the centroid location of C3 or A3 centroid location. So that now is all my components. And notice that here I use the summation, right? So remember what I said earlier, that if you just sum up this part and this part and this part, you would not get your final answer because you're completely ignoring this part, which is the parallel axis theorem part, and here as well, which actually adds a lot of stiffness. So I invite you to actually calculate this value and then calculate this value, and you will see that this value most often has a much higher contribution. In fact, there are some engineers out there who don't even worry about this part. They just use the area and take the distance and square it just because it's conservative and this is percentage-wise very little compared to this. And the larger the cross-section becomes, the more significant this becomes. However, you want to know the result for this. So let me tell you the result and keep in mind that we, of course, always use four significant figures and that we have super large numbers here and strange units. So the answer is 7,200 92 times 10 to the 5 millimeter to the power of 4. And I'll be honest with you, this is something that is very difficult to develop a feel for. Like if this is right or wrong, it's not a, a number that you see often or something you can really develop a feel for unless you calculate it many, many times. But maybe even one mechanics class is not enough to do that. So the best way to get a feel for it or to counterbalance that you don't have a feel for it is actually find another way to break this down into different sections and calculate your IX in an alternative way. So another way that you could do, for example, is you can calculate an entire rectangle and then subtract this rectangle and subtract this rectangle. Because we keep in mind that a summation can also be a negative summation, right? So you can have the entire rectangle and subtract something. However, I promise you that this is the right answer for now. And we can move on to IX to, sorry, to IY to continue with our educational experience here. So how do I calculate now IY? I encourage you to pause the video and calculate it for yourself or give it a try. I, of course, will not wait for that. I'm just going to continue now. So for my A1 base times height now, or actually base, hi, sorry, height times base cubed. So that would be 50 times 200 cubed divided by 12. And that is my individual moment of inertia. Now I need to add the area. So 200 times 50. But now what is the distance, right? What is the distance from the total centroid, the green part here, C total, to C1 in the x direction, right? Keep in mind that we're using here dx. What is that distance? That actually is equal to zero once again. So zero here squared. And so this entire thing goes to zero. And now because we already been through that learning experience, I can tell you that the next part a2 is exactly the same so i'm just going to multiply this by two and last but not least i have to add my a3 so which now i have to of course look at it pretty much in the direction of the x-axis so my base now is 300 and my height is 50. so 300 times 50 cubed divided by 12 and then plus area times zero again right so this goes to zero again once again the the centroid locations coincide with each other so this goes to zero so i don't have to worry about that and 
now the final numerical answer for this would be equal to something that better be smaller than my ix because you can already tell that this has a very strong axis about a uh, strong resistance about bending about the x-axis whereas about the y-axis the material is not far removed from it so therefore it should be a smaller number and you should see this in many problems that you solve like this in fact you're actually looking at 697 697.9 times 10 to the 5 millimeter to the power of 4. And now I solve the entire problem. Of course, I have to double underline my results here. And I am done solving that. So let's take a look, a final look at it. I think now it should be clear how I calculate my I bar X prime my ai and what my dy is and th this is the one that is the biggest challenge for a beginner and another challenge is to not forget the squaring component here here i did not square my zero here of course um, for legal reasons i guess i should just put it in there so you cannot sue me but um i obviously i didn't need it anyways however it is my experience that students like to forget this. Well, they probably don't like to forget it, but it just happens. So please sharpen your senses for that component. And I think this problem now we solved. And I hope that all your questions have been answered for a simple structure like this or a simple cross section like this. And of course, we will now look into more complicated ones or we will increase our difficulty level a little bit and introduce also different shapes. So here we have a problem that's maybe a little bit more interesting and a little bit more challenging and more challenging is more interesting, right? So therefore we can expand our knowledge about the moment of inertia and try to see if we really understand how to move forward with this. First of all, let's look at the problem statement we need to calculate ix and iy for the concrete barrier i'll be honest with you these dimensions here are not conducive towards concrete for sure not like it would be way too small for like a real concrete barrier but the concept still applies so for real concrete barrier probably this would be more in dimensions of feet or something like that however to get the educational point across we can easily do that um, note that this problem also asks you the the centroid location must be determined first and we have done this in a previous example so i'm just gonna put that information in here i believe we had this to be calculated somewhere right there and i believe our value was something 2.5 let me look that up for you but first i'm gonna put this information in here so we calculated this with x sorry y bar so we have y bar here and that was equal to 2.565 2.565 and that will teach us something very valuable when we talk about dy and dx and so on um, notice also that the centroid location coincides with the y-axis so i do not need to calculate anything else than the y bar so i don't need to calculate the x bar but we talked about that in that lecture all right like we did in the centroid lecture we also have to section our element now into area elements that are of known shape and known geometry and i believe we did it so that the horizontal part on the bottom is actually continuous so i'm gonna do that here as well and then I have my different areas. And I believe this here was our area one. So I'm gonna call that A1. And then I have an area down here, which I'm gonna call A2. And then I believe we named these here A3A and A3B. So I'm gonna do that here again, A3B. Now, notice that each one of them has a centroid location. So this one here, for example, has a centroid location right there. Then there's a centroid location right there. 
and we have in the third points. And I'm just symbolically showing these here. I will, as I go through the calculation, refer back to them. But before I do that, let me point out that what we really need, for example, for A1 is the distance from here to here, right? And I will show you a trick of how you can get that very easily and very reliably without using a lot of brain power. So how do you get the distance from here to here? Um, you can easily structure that approach. As always, I start with my formula. So if I have to calculate Ix, I usually have to find the summation of I bar x prime and a i d y squared and i also have to do that for i y so the summation of i bar y prime plus a i d x squared and now with that said again it would probably be suitable for a tabulated approach here but to me, there's still not enough shapes to actually use a table. A lot of people prefer a table method. I do not unless I have a very big structure that has a lot of different shapes. This here has only like a maximum of four shapes. I don't even bother. It takes too much time, especially on an exam. I would waste too much time setting up my table and thinking about what to fill into the table instead of actually completing these equations. So let's start with Ix. Ix is equal to, for shape number one, base times height cubed, right? So what is the base? That's one inch. And the height, be careful, is 7.5 cubed over 12, plus the area, which is the same, one plus 7.5. And in fact, I said the same because I have a, I developed a habit over the years to just set this up with a lot of brain power. And then this I do blindly by just copying what, what's going on here. And that's why I said it's the same. But now the, the lever arm is what? The lever arm is the distance from the centroid of the individual shape to the centroid of the total shape. And so I will make my life easy, actually. I know that this here is 7.5 halves, right? So remember that... Um, I have this distance here, which is 7.5 over 2, which is equal to 3.75. So that 3.75 is also true on the bottom part. So I'm just going to now move from here all the way down, and then I subtract this part. That will make my life much easier than actually using a lot of brain power. So 7.5 divided by 2 plus... 1. Where is that 1 coming from? I have to, like right now, I went from here to here, and now I need to add the 1, and then I need to subtract this. So minus 2.565. Of course, I cannot forget to square this, otherwise I'm in trouble. But now I'm done with my part number 1. So let's move on to part number 2, plus base times height. In this case, it's 6 wide, and the height is 1, which needs to be cubed, of course, has no impact here, divided by 12, plus my area, which I can once again copy blindly, 6 by 1, and now the distance, I'm just gonna go 0 0.5 minus 2.565. And yes, this is a negative number, but remember, I can just square it and I don't care about this. So what did I do here? I moved from the centroid location down and then I subtracted this, which is the same as taking the inverse if you don't square it. So like 2.565 minus 0 0.5. And maybe in this case, it would be very simple to do that. But I want to give you this approach because Later on, you may find very complicated structures where you have to add like three, four, five directions or distances to each other and then subtract it. And this method always works. So I would always go from the point that I want down to the, or to the reference axis and then subtract that value. Okay, now we can use our A3A. And what is that? So now we're using a rectangle sorry not a rectangle anymore but a triangle so what is it base times height cubed divided by 36 right 
So the base here is 2.5. Be careful about that. It's not 3, it's 2.5. Why is that? Because from here to here, I need to subtract the 0.5 here. So 0. Point, uh, sorry, 2.5 times 1.5 cubed divided by 36. This is important. This is because it's a triangle. Plus the area, which is 1 half times 2.5 times 1.5. And now my lever arm is what? So I have to move from here down to here. So I would say one third of 1.5 plus one and then subtract the lever arm. So let's do that. So one third times 1.5 and to stay with my colors here plus one and minus 2.56. 5 and then the whole thing squared again and now I have defined my entire A3A and what you will notice that we're taking Ix and so this distance here goes down in this direction and therefore my A3A is identical to a3b so i don't have to do anything else but multiply this by two because i am only interested in the vertical direction remember this here is dy right so maybe i should put that in there as well so this here is dy for shape number three and so therefore i just multiply it by two and if you do that properly you will find and I encourage you, by the way, to really try to type these things into your calculator because in an exam situation, it's always critical to do this in a timely fashion. And it's very easy to mistype anything here. Um, so I really recommend that you try these in a real life situation, typing in and checking your own mistakes and so on. But if you solve this correctly, you will find that it's 101.8 inch to the four and this is a result so i double underline it and that concludes my ix now let's take a look at our iy so that is the moment about the y-axis so iy would be equal to now my base times height changes right so my height now is in this direction so base is 7.5 so 7.5 times 1 cubed, which of course doesn't matter, 12 divided by 12 plus the area multiplied by 0. Right? So I don't worry about this in this case. I'll explain that one more time. This distance of the centroid of the individual shape of A1 to the centroid of the total shape is zero because we're dealing with the x direction, right? So we're dealing with dx here. So that would be the distance in the x direction. And that is zero actually for all elements here for a1, a2, except for the triangles. So you understand that. I can move on to the shape number two, which is base times height cubed. And in this case, it's one times six cubed divided by 12 plus the area times zero again same effect i don't have to explain that again but now we're dealing with the triangle and that will become a little bit more interesting so what is the base now the base is 1.5 1.5 the height is 2.5 cubed divided by 36 plus my area, one half, 1.5 times 2.5. And now the distance, what do I need? Technically, I need two distances, the one from here to here and the one from here to here. But keep in mind that my distance is squared anyways, right? So if it's a negative number, which it would be here for A3A, if it is a negative number, I square it and it becomes positive, which makes it identical to the one here on the right side for A3B. So I only worry about one, but let's take A3A. And so what I need is one third of the base, which is one third of 2.5. And then 
add 0.5 to it. And that would be my distance. So I open my bracket here and I have 2.5 times one third, right? So 2.5 times one third plus 0.5. And that needs to be squared. I cannot forget about that. And this whole thing exists two times. And I want to zoom in real quick just so that we understand what's going on here. So what I did is I took the distance from here to here, which is one third of 2.5. And then I added 0.5 to here. So that is my distance that I'm using for this calculation. And now take a look at this entire structure and notice that much more material is removed from the centroid in the vertical direction, which is what we calculated here. Whereas in the horizontal direction, a lot of material is much closer to the centroid. And therefore you will find that the result needs to be much smaller than this. In fact, if you calculate this out, you should find that your IY, and again, please type this into your calculator to get used to those calculations, 26.53 inch to the four is your answer here, which is significantly less than what you have calculated for IX. So now I encourage you to calculate problems like these. I think we have deciphered it and we took the next step to include actually our triangles here. And we also have a better understanding now to the centroidal distance because we have them removed here uh, in the y direction and then here in the x direction. And that should give you an insight on how to calculate ix and iy in any scenario because this concept remains the same of course you may end up with different shapes which then has an influence on this component or i guess i should sh should say about and on this component here but the concept remains the same and so i don't think there's a lot of value here in me running more problems with you now it's a question of you repeating this of course i'm going to give you a little bit of a hint for the next problem but Overall, I think we have deciphered the moment of inertia, how to derive the equation and how to apply it. And I wish you good luck with your homework on that. And I think you now have the tools you need and that you can do it and good luck. So here we have a wonderful educational example of a steel plate in which you are asked to find the moment of inertia about the x-axis and the y-axis and i will not solve this for you right now but i will give you some hints so that you have the tools to check if you're correct or not and i will also emphasize the wonderful educational experience that you can get through this first of all you have circles in here so it gives you a chance to actually apply your knowledge about circle circular holes from a moment of inertia standpoint in addition, these are holes, so you can learn how to use the subtractive method. And then what you see here, you have actually four holes, but if you imagine that there's a horizontal x-axis and a vertical y-axis, then you will see that two of the circles actually are removed from the centroid and two of the circles are actually close to the centroid. And so what that means, so let's say I take the moment of inertia about the x-axis here that I just drew for you, then you will find that these two blue circles, those are actually, they have a centroid location here and here, and they are removed from the total centroid location, which is right there. However, if I look at these purple circles, they actually have a centroid right there and right there. And so they are not removed from the centroid of the total shape. Another thing you can do with this problem, and I encourage you to do that, is also to calculate the moment of inertia about these axes, right? So you can do it for horizontal. So I'm going to call this here XA and this here YA. So I encourage you to find the moment of inertia first about the horizontal axis and the vertical axis and then what's probably easier at least for you conceptually 
is the moment of inertia about this axis and this axis. And to do that, just rotate your, pa your piece of paper by 45 degrees and it will become much easier, right? And also you will have easier access to the symmetry of the problem. In fact, let's talk about symmetry. So this, the system is definitely symmetric, right? So symmetric, symmetric problem. And what you will find is actually that I x is equal to i y in this case and you will also find that the i x a is equal to i y a and maybe you will find even something else about the relationship between these two if you solve it however so that you can check your results let me give you the results for my calculation for i x and i y and what I have found here was 1760 times 10 to the 6 millimeters to the power of 4. See, with millimeters, you quickly end up with very large numbers. Um, and again, that is something you should practice and not de necessarily develop a feel for, but at least don't doubt yourself anymore when you get these strange numbers. And... With that said, I think you have everything you need for this problem and I hope you are a little bit curious about it and you will try to solve it. Please try your best to compare the two results here what I showed you with the blue arrows because you will hopefully have an aha moment if you do so. And with that said, we're done with all the problems and the last thing that's left for us to do is to take a look at our achievements of the lecture so please go ahead and ask yourself what are the takeaways and what are the things that you learned here and then probably more important is what is not clear to you and how can you get a better understanding or develop a better understanding of that i encourage you to really write that out because that is already enough to understand what you need to do sometimes and then I want to go ahead and check these boxes off with you, but not without talking about the importance of each of these boxes. So first of all, the moment of inertia is a resistance to bending. Some in physics is called angular acceleration, right? The resistance to angular acceleration. But really for us, that means it's a resistance to bending, right? So to bending. And hopefully from my introduction, this is clear to you and you can actually check this off. You, of course, still remember how to calculate the centroid location. You can still do that. And you can also now calculate the moment of inertia for individual geometric simple shapes. And again, this is what we were talking about in the table. And we called that I bar x prime and y bar x uh, y prime so that i can check off as well because that was the initial portion of the lecture and then we of course calculated actually the moment of inertia for composite shapes so the composite shape is really everything we have done in the examples that i showed you but how did you do that you did that by applying the parallel exit theorem so you find this in the lecture portion so lecture that was the last part of the lecture and then the calculation of composite shapes was the examples right and that is really what you need to be able to do and i think you can check that off so with that said let's move on to the homework and let's see what problems you can solve to practice your understanding of these concepts now so here you see your upcoming homework and let me give you hints so that solving these problems will be much easier for you. So for example, here we have the first problem in which you have effectively three shapes, a circle, a circle and a rectangle. And please see or note that you have to calculate the centroid location first. Of course, this shape is symmetric about the vertical axis, but it's not symmetric about the horizontal axis unless your D is equal to your C, then you are very lucky, All right? But if that's not the case, then you have to calculate Y bar first. And to do that, um, please don't 
worry about the fact that you have a little bit of overlap of the circle here and the rectangle and the circle here and the rectangle. In fact, just calculate them as individual. So here's a circle, here's a circle, and then you also just have the overlap of the rectangle here. I'm, I'm ex ex exaggerating here a little bit, but please do not start to subtract these from each other. That's beyond the concept that we're talking about here. And it, it's not conducive towards your learning experience. So we want you to understand the moment of inertia. We don't want you to do unnecessary math here. So that, I think, should give you enough hints for this problem. For this angle here, um, very straightforward, very simple shapes. You can break it down in different ways. But again, you have to probably calculate the centroid location first, which, of course, is already done for you here in a sense. But you need that to then calculate the moment of inertia of this shape. And you need to do it about the x and the y axis. And hopefully that will help you to develop a better understanding as well. Now let's take a look at this problem here. So here I suggest that you actually start thinking differently. Um, after you calculate y bar, you of course know where x bar is because it's just in the middle, like c and c, it's symmetric here about the vertical axis. But um, all you have to do here is actually find y bar first and then the think different part should kick in. I recommend that you actually look at this as a big rectangle and then you subtract a triangle and you subtract this rectangle because notice that this here is a hole in the shape, right? And so I want you to use this problem to actually practice the summation formula by subtracting. Remember that summation can also be subtracting or adding negative parts. And so just try to subtract this triangle, this triangle and this rectangle. And I think that will give you another powerful tool to be fast in engineering and of course in your exam. Then we have this problem here on the bottom. You have seen this before. It's actually part of the example problems that you were supposed to solve on your own. Um, and when, if you have done that, then you have done half the work already because you need the centroid location first and then you find the moment of inertia. Once again, it's probably easier to subtract the circle. In fact, you have to subtract the circle because this is a negative area. And here you can probably subtract the triangle. Um, here, this I would not do subtractive. I would add this because it's very difficult to subtract everything here to the left of the circle. It's easier to use the semicircle here for your calculation. So I think that deciphers the problems on this page. Let me move on to the last page. So here you see very common structures. Um, here an I-beam, this should be very, pretty much a walk in the park after what we talked about here in this class uh, or in this video lectures. So simple shapes and you know that it's doubly symmetric, so therefore you know exactly where the centroid location is. Notice here that the centroid location is actually outside of the C-channel and that is confusing sometimes to students, but you can still calculate it as you usually do. So find your y prime and x prime axis. And then you have literally only three areas to deal with to find the distance to here. Notice that the thickness of the metal is identical everywhere. And I think this problem should not cause a lot of trouble to you, especially if you solved all the problems before. And with that said, I wish you good luck with your homework and um, I hope we learned something new about mechanics that interests you and will help you in the future. And I will see you soon. Good luck.